Welcome to part 3 of a G.I. Joe A Real American Hero series focusing on vehicles and their real world counterparts. Thanks for watching JLS Comics. If you liked the video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe. I upload videos just like this every week. Alright, let's jump into our story. Some of the vehicles on this list served as actual inspiration for the G.I. Joe version, but many came out afterwards and are simply fun to compare and contrast. G.I. Joe project manager Kurt Bozigian says he bought a 22 volume set of encyclopedias on the military as part of his research where he looked at armaments and design down to uniforms, badges, tabs, and even acronyms and said that this new G.I. Joe line would need to feel like it's military. From early development, all the toys and vehicles and playsets were grounded in reality until the Wizards in R&D got their hands on them and they evolved into something else with lots of cannons and weapons and hardpoints and wings and the like. And later on, much of this realism was lost to the fanciful and sci-fi and extreme, especially in the 90s. And with that stage set, let's jump into our first vehicle on today's list. In our last episode in this series, we explored the history of G.I. Joe's Vamp. Well, we're not quite done. In 2011, a version of the Vamp was released in the 30th anniversary line that came with Steel Brigade Delta as a driver. This version was used as well for the up-armored 2012 Ninja Combat Cruiser driven by Night Fox that also had a quad missile launcher on the roof and 2014's G.I. Joe Rescue Ops 4x4. This Vamp, also designated a Vamp Mark II, featured a roof-mounted spinning Gatling gun, a firing rocket launcher, detachable wheels, and a front bumper-mounted retracting capture claw. For real-world inspiration, we need to look no farther than General Dynamics Flyer 72. The Flyer 72 is powered by a 195 horsepower, 2 liter General Motors dual overhead cam bi turbocharged intercooled diesel direct injection JP8 engine inside of a tubular space frame and rollover protection system that can support the weight of the entire vehicle. Flyer 72 can seat up to 9, travel up to 95 miles per hour, and has a maximum range of 300 miles at mission profile and 500 miles on flat ground at 40 miles per hour. It has an advanced lightweight chassis and suspension that allows it to travel over rough dangerous terrain at speed while also protecting its occupants and carrying up to 5,700 pounds of payload. At 72 inches wide, the Flyer 72 is capable of being transported via internal or sling transport by C-MH-47 helicopters or sling loaded to a UH-60 or via C-130 low velocity airdrop. The main weapon turret, which can rotate 360 degrees, can hold armaments from M2 through 40 millimeters. It can wield an M230 chain gun, GAU 19 50 cal Gatling gun, or even a Mark 44 30 millimeter minigun. And door mounted arm swings can also be added to mount smaller caliber weapons. The Flyer 72 Advanced Light Strike Vehicle was chosen by US SOCOM for the GMV 1.1 program, the Army's Ground Mobility Vehicle Program. They wanted something lightly armored fast and something you could drop from the air. Changing gears, pun intended, we arrive at the Dreadnought Thunder Machine. The Thunder Machine is truly a Frankenstein, Mad Max inspired vehicle. When it first released in 1986, the Thunder Machine was boxed with a driver named Thrasher. According to the vehicle's Action Force TAC profile, it's powered by a Wright J65 turbojet engine which was stolen from a US Navy A4 Skyhawk that had been mothballed at Davis Monthan Air Base in Arizona. The jet engine can produce 21,000 pounds of thrust which can push the Thunder Machine to 115 miles per hour on pavement and 53 miles per hour on off-road terrain on 225-60 HR15 off-road tires. Thunder Machine is armed with a pair of M51 cannons that fire either 2,500 rounds of 20mm high explosive ammunition at a rate of either 1,000 or 3,000 rounds per minute that the Dreadnoughts stole from the Florida National Guard Armory. These are stationary and so to put rounds on target the driver has to line the entire vehicle up with the target. Dreadnoughts took parts from his tank, armor, along with axle, steering, and suspension components from a Stinger Jeep, a transmission lifted from a Cobra Hydrofoil, and a front nose that was scavenged from a 1978 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. Onboard radio, radar, and threat identification systems were taken from a Cobra Mamba helicopter. The 78 Pontiac Firebird, by the way, is the same car used by Burt Reynolds in the famous Smokey and the Bandit film, which pushed it from popular pace car ready to legendary status, including that screaming chicken on the bonnet. The G.I. Joe team and Cobra also use a variety of other vehicles to operate in cold weather environments. Vehicles like the Snowcat and Tiger Force's Tiger Cat, as well as the Street Fighter Devastator, the Pursuit of Cobra Wolfhound, the Havoc Mark II, and Cobra's 2015 Basilisk. The Half-Track Snowcat was first released in 1985 and it came with a driver named Frostbite. It boasts a 9 liter, 680 horsepower, direct ignition engine and transaxle assembly, high traction off-road tires, and a four-wheel half-track drive. 
It comes armed with low-pressure, high-speed avalanche ski missiles and shockwave electronic HE-27 250-pound missiles, a track still battle platform and a host of redundant systems aimed at de-icing, ventilation and defrosting. And there isn't a direct real-world counterpart to the Snowcat and its derivatives, however, half-tracks have been used since the turn of the 20th century. These historical examples are meant to combine the terrain versatility of tanks with the maneuverability of the more common wheeled vehicles. The tracks help distribute weight and thus enable it to cross sand, dirt, snow and other types of earth where wheels would typically sink. Adolf Kagris converted a variety of Russian Tsar Nicholas II's cars to half-tracks in order to traverse the snow of Russia. A track system also utilized by Vladimir Lenin's Rolls-Royce Ghost. In World War II, the half-track became prolific, with M2s and M3s, International Harvester M5s, M16s serving in every theater of war, even helping to storm the beaches of Normandy during D-Day. Prolific though they were, the vehicles lacked roof protection and thus exposed the troops inside air bursts and elevated attacks like strafing from Luftwaffe planes. The M2 design is inspired by those that French manufacturer Citroën produced in the 20s and 30s. Half-tracks continue to be used by various countries after the war and are, in fact, still in use by both Israeli and Mexican armed forces to this day. There were dozens of variants produced, including a half-track with four M2 Ma-Deuce machine guns mounted on the back and fed by a 200-round drum of ammunition each that was brought to bear at a rate of 635 rounds per minute to take down Messerschmitts, Fokkers, Junkers in the airspace above the battlefield, and later it was used on ground troops and became the M16 MGMC, the multiple gun motor carriage. It was devastating. G.I. Joe's heavy articulated vehicle ordnance carrier Havoc and its variant the Skyhawk were also used heavily by the Joe teams. Havoc first appeared in 1986 and included cross country as a driver. The Havoc is powered by a 9 liter 900 horsepower twin turbo diesel engine. Havoc is armed with repeater 9mm autoload machine guns, Lancer bipulse guided missiles, leveler dual recoilless 75mm cannons, a track sill battle platform, and 7.62mm computer synchronized machine guns. It also has vertical pitch control lifting hover fans built into a detachable scout craft. In 2020, the Senate Appropriations Committee tasked the U.S. Army with testing and acquiring cold-weather Arctic environment vehicles and equipment, due largely in part to the recession of the ice shelf at a rate of 13% per decade, and Russian moves into the frigid regions above and around the Arctic Circle where they've continued to install resources like air bases in a bid to claim control over the northern sea route, an inevitable battlefront of the future. The U.S. Army will be testing a replacement to the BV-206 SUSV, the small unit support vehicle, from August through December. BAE has submitted their BVS-10 Viking and BVS-10 Beowulf, and ST Engineering has submitted the Bronco 3 for the program in response to the Army's request. The SUSV replacements will be designated the Cold Weather All-Terrain Vehicle, or CAT-V. Program leaders working with Army Futures Command said the CAT-V, quote, will provide transportation in extreme cold weather conditions for up to nine personnel to support emergency medical evacuation, command and control capacity, and general cargo transportation. BAE Systems and Haglund's BB-206 had a 2.8-liter, 99-kilowatt Ford Cologne engine and Allison MD-2560 automatic transmission that can produce 275 horsepower and up to 65 kilometers per hour on paved roads. It began life as an all-terrain, articulated tracked vehicle in 1974 to replace Volkswagen's Bondwagen 202, which uses a Cagrease track system, inspired by the inventor Adolf Cagrease that we talked about earlier in this video. The BV uses a unique hydraulic steerage linkage to protect the front and rear cars. The BVS-10 Viking is the third generation articulated tracked vehicle made by Haglund's. BVS-10 is powered by a Cummins 5.9-liter inline six-cylinder turbocharged diesel engine that can reach 43 miles per hour on roads and can operate in temperatures ranging from negative 51 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. The armored hull can withstand small arms and artillery fire, and the up-armored versions protect up to 14.5 millimeters. BVS-10 is armed with a range of weapons depending on mission requirements from 5.56mm to 12.7mm to even 40mm grenade launchers in addition to the two smoke grenade dischargers and mortars in the front and back. All that armor and armament protect the four passengers in the front and up to eight passengers in the rear car. Both tracked cars are linked by a steering mechanism. The UK Ministry of Defense uses these models for a variety of roles like troop carrier, command vehicle, and repair recovery vehicle configurations. And all three variants are fully air portable under a Chinook helicopter, either complete or in two separate front and rear component parts, and are able to as well be carried by a C-130 Hercules. 
It could also carry bolt-on armor plates and slotted or bar armor systems, although this proved not quite enough in Afghanistan and quite a few were destroyed by IEDs. That's when the ST Kinetics Bronco All-Terrain Tracked Vehicle entered service, where it was quickly called the Warthog. Don't worry, we'll cover the G.I. Joe's Warthog in a future video. So the British Warthog last saw service in 2015, but it will be converted to a transporter for the Royal Artillery Thales Watchkeeper WK-450 UAV system. After Warthog was temporarily retired, the Royal Marines and British Army refurbished their BVS-10 fleet to a Mark II version, made with steel armor plates that could protect against 7.62mm AP or even 152mm artillery shell fragments, and they could also be outfitted with level 2 protection against mines and IEDs with slot armor for RPG production or BVS Mark II gets a common six-cylinder inline turbo diesel engine that can put out 275 horsepower, hit the same 65 kilometers per hour on roads for a range of 500 clicks of its predecessor, despite the heavier armor package, partly due to the 620 millimeter wide molded rubber tracks which help disperse the Vikings' ground pressure. Finally, for this video, we take a look at the G.I. Joe Battle Wagon from 1991. The G.I. Joe Battle Wagon was heavily armed. It came with dual barrel, synchro fire laser cannons, computer controlled flank fire machine guns, and an 8 shot rotating semi automatic motorized cannon. There is storage on the starboard side of the truck for an additional 4 surface to air missiles, giving the vehicle a firing capacity of 12 missiles. In 2015, the US Army awarded Oshkosh Defense a $6.7 billion contract for just under 17,000 joint light tactical vehicles. The JLTV program was originally intended to supplant the less maneuverable MRAPs and the Under Armour Humvees as the primary 4x4 off-road truck in the inventory, but budget cuts, reposturing by the Marines to a more expeditionary stance and added oversight have caused the Armour to revisit the initial contract and add other Avengers to the RFP where they will share the technical data package with Oshkosh's competitors. The JLTV comes in heavy guns, utility, general purpose, and close combat weapons carrier mission packages in 4-seat combat tactical vehicle configurations and a 2-seat combat support vehicle configuration. All of them are C4, ISR compatible, and offer a great variety of plug-and-play performance capabilities for a wide range of mission types. The JLTV uses a patented TAC-4i independent suspension system that allows it to travel over dang near anything from a raised stance, allowing it to traverse up to 60 inches of water to a lowered stance to match Hummer's 74-inch roof height that allows it to fit in the cargo transport holds. It can even park on uneven terrain and level out no matter which set of wheels are lower. It's powered by a Duramax 6.6 liter turbo diesel V8 called the Gale Banks Engineering A86T, an Allison 6-speed auto transmission that puts out just over 400 horsepower and 850 pound-feet of torque, which can push the JLTV to a max of 70 miles per hour. At 2019's Modern Day Marine Expo in Quantico, Virginia, Oshkosh showed off multiple variations to the JLTV JLTVs on display at the show boasted a Boeing close laser weapon system, a Kongsberg Protector LW-30 remote weapon system with a M230 LF cannon, a VRS Black Hornet vehicle recovery system, and a C4 ISR suite that included Thales VRC-111 and Thales VRC-121 Viper. Another of the show was outfitted with a Boeing Avenger 2 shore ride launcher, including an M3P 50 cal machine gun, M299 four rail launcher that holds AIM 9X Sidewinders or AGM 114 Hellfire missiles. Other variants can bring man pads, 8 capacity Stinger missiles, Javelins via the Javelin integration kit, tow anti tank missiles, or 33mm chain guns to bear on the enemy. The heavy guns carrier variant can be mounted with a common remotely operated weapon system, Crows with a Javelin integration kit and a 50 cal machine gun. JLTVs can also be outfitted with non-kinetic weapon platforms like the Thor microwave gun to counter UAV swarms, and there's even an ambulance variant. Another version of the JLTV, a two-door variant, was shown with a six-round rear-mounted launcher for the U-Vision Hero 120 tactical system, a loitering munition, also known as a suicide drone, which can loiter in flight for over an hour, over 21.6 nautical miles, before delivering a 3.5 kilogram warhead on target which can be either air burst frags, point detonation like you'd want for buildings and strong points, and high explosive top attack payloads which would be good for detonating atop tanks and, and AFVs. The Hero 400 ES launcher can double the air type of the Hero 120, making it 2 hours. However, it's not all guns and roses for Oshkosh's JLTV, as I was saying earlier. In fact, it's run into some problems in the last couple of years. Federal funding has cut the program by nearly $300 million and more, the U.S. Army will be recompeting Oshkosh's entry. 
It comes at a time when Army Futures Command is pivoting focus towards soldier lethality, long-range precision firing, future vertical next-gen combat vehicles along with air and missile defense, and so the JLTV program, coupled with the focus away from the last wars to something like a northern focus like we were talking about before, doesn't give the JLTV a bucket to neatly fall into. In fact, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper said that the JLTV is over-specialized for, quote, the kinds of counterinsurgency conflicts the Pentagon isn't conducting anymore. According to Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy, the U.S. Army contracted for just over 49,000 JLTVs to be delivered over the course of multiple years, which were intended to replace the 55,000 Humvees in the fleet. And so this gives those high-mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicles a longer lifespan. These are to operate alongside the 800 infantry squad vehicles. JLTV's production contract runs through 2023, and at that point, they'll be recompeting for other entries in a bid for something with a broader skill set, but also to drive that production cost down. With the technical data package in their hands, this will go to any new competitors that enter the fray. But Oshkosh isn't worried. A spokesman said, The program remains on time and on budget, with nearly 6,000 vehicles delivered to the U.S. Army and Marine Corps customer. Oshkosh Defense is committed to building TWVs, tactical wheeled vehicles, that can protect our warfighters in both hostile insurgency and near-peer threat environments, so that they may complete their missions and return them home safely. This all said, the JLTV with the massive launcher on the back is perhaps the closest in real life to the G.I. Joe's battle wagon concept. And with that, we've arrived at the end of this installment of G.I. Joe Vehicles and their real-world counterparts. What's your favorite vehicle on this list? Let me know in the comments below. And stay tuned in coming weeks as we continue to explore the vehicles of G.I. Joe on air, sea, and land. Until then, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.